The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We have had the blessing, by the way, of uh, as we've been reading through the Bible, reading all those verses that I cite as the call to worship. We just recently read uh, the one about the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. And so we've been blessed to go through all of that. We've even seen some of the verses that I quote at the end of class as well. So hopefully everybody has been blessed by this reading through the Bible. Again, uh, what it, my plan is at this point is that Next year, what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of a break. I encourage you to still read the Bible. Don't, don't uh, use this break as an opportunity to just to not look at the Bible at all, but uh, take the time to uh, continue to read in it. Go, go back and look at some of the books and some of the passages that you read throughout this year and go back and reread them. But sometime after the first of the year, I'm going to decide upon a reading plan that's going to be a two-year two plan and uh, it will include the idea that we'll read some of the Old Testament and some of the New Testament passages each week. And I think that'll be a little bit easier for folks to be able to have some of the old and some of the new and to have it be doled out over a two-year period instead of uh, the one year that we did this year. But I felt like it was really important for us as a body of believers to go through and read the entire Bible. You don't want to get to heaven and, and uh, be face-to-face -face with your Savior and say, well, I'm sorry I never read your book. I never did, but uh, you want to be able to say, I did indeed read the Word. So we're going to get back to our study now on spiritual gifts. We are studying spiritual gifts. It's kind of a little side study that we're doing in our major Bible theme study, spiritual gifts. We have looked at four gifts. I will go back and do a review of those four gifts to make sure that we're clear on those things before proceeding forward. I want everybody to have a good understanding of this because in the end, when we're done with all of this, I want you to be praying about what your gift or gifts might be and uh, asking God to show you how to use that gift in ministry and that He would be the one that produced the effects. Uh, but once we finish this study on spiritual gifts, we're actually going to go back to our major Bible theme study from the book and we're going to look at uh, sin and uh, God's solution for sin. So that's upcoming. You have that to look forward to. And when we do that, uh, I have decided at this point to follow Gary's advice and uh, spend great amount of detail looking at what it is that actually happens in the work of salvation. One of the things that really struck me when I was studying all of that is that we often think of the work of, sal of salvation as what Christ did on the cross. Now, what Christ did on the cross was absolutely necessary for our salvation, but truthfully, the proper terminology would be that the work of salvation is what God does to the individual when that individual places his or her faith in Jesus Christ. That is actually the work of salvation, and it's the Father that does that work along with the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the, the work of Christ on the cross is, is absolutely critical, and without it, we could not be saved. But truthfully, that term, the work of salvation, should be used to describe what God does when we believe. And we're going to talk about that in detail because I want everybody to be clear about all of the grace blessings that have been bestowed upon us as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Now, before we go in and study spiritual gifts, it's important for us to be partakers of one of those spiritual blessings, which is the filling of the Holy Spirit, which we receive as we are walking in the light. We receive the filling at the moment of our salvation, but the truth is when we confess sins, we I mean, when we commit sin, excuse me, we grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. When we confess our sins, we are restored to fellowship and the filling of the Spirit, and we need that filling of the Spirit in order to be able to understand spiritual truth. So let's take a moment for silent prayer to make sure we are indeed filled with the Holy Spirit so we can learn through His ministry. Shall we pray? Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give us a focus this hour, that we'd be able to hone in on the things that we're learning from your word, that we would learn the lessons you've prepared for us, be taught by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Help us to be humble enough to receive the things that you're teaching us today. 
And Father, I ask that the indwelling Holy Spirit and His power and His wisdom would overcome my shortcomings in being a little bit under the weather today, that You would keep my voice strong enough for me to be able to communicate these things, and that each and every one of us, including myself, would be edified through the teaching of Your Word today, and that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And we pray all these things in His most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, we have been studying, and uh, by the way, that's a, term, a phrase that I use when I close our prayer meetings in the back. Our Savior is the one to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And that's a, a blessing for us to be able to be partakers of uh, whatever we, we receive in grace from God, but to, to bring glory to Him. Well, we have been studying here in spiritual gifts, and we are working our way through the gifts of the church, and we looked first at helps, and uh, I'm going to go through these very quickly. Everybody has the capacity to help, but believer, a believer that's received this particular spiritual gift has the ability to perform this activity of helps above and beyond anything that an ordinary believer can do, but recognize an ordinary believer is enabled through the filling of the Holy Spirit to already do this at a very high level anyway, right? Every one of us has the indwelling Holy Spirit, and through the filling of the Spirit, we are empowered to help others. But those who have this gift have a surpassing grace empowerment, which allows them to work in conjunction with others and their giftedness. Now, we talked about helps and service last time. I will review that here in a moment. Those with the gift of service, again, all of us have the capacity to be of service to others, but those with the gift of service, the diakonia gift, those who have this gift are able to provide service and ministry to others in a unique way above and beyond what an ordinary believer can do. Uh, both of these gifts are well suited for the office of deacon, but certainly the gift of helps, by the way, it just fits everywhere. It just fits almost with anything in, the, in, in any ministry within the local church because it's a cooperative gift. It works in conjunction with another's gift. Service is a different gift. It's, a, it's the idea of doing those tasks to serve and minister to another, but not in conjunction with the giftedness and not in conjunction with the ministry directly. And so, for example, the comparison I gave last time, the analogy I gave was the carpenter. If you have a carpenter who's, who's doing a job, somebody who has the gift of service would be able to come in and they would be able to fulfill duties such as running extension cords, bringing tools, uh, getting the, the nails to help the carpenter do the job, uh, running to the, to the lumber yard and picking up supplies, uh, all kinds of things that are associated with carpentry work, but not the actual carpentry work. In other words, the server, the server minister would not actually do the carpentry work, but would do a lot of the activities that make it such that the carpenter can do his job better and more efficiently. That's the server minister. And that was the original tasking of the, the original deacons in the church. They were serving tables so that the leaders, the disciples, the apostles and disciples could then spend their time in study and prayer. And so they were, not, they were not involved in the studying and the teaching and the praying and the different things. I'm sure they were involved in the praying to some extent. But these deacons, instead, they were taking care of other things so that the, the apostles, the disciples could focus on what they needed to do to edify the flock, edify those in the assembly. So this is the idea of the diakonia gift, the server minister gift. So, but the one who has the gift of helps that individual would come alongside the carpenter. Now, this individual is not a carpenter, but this individual would be able to come alongside the carpenter and help build the cabinets, help hang the doors, help put the sheetrock up, help do whatever it is, although I don't know, carpenters try to avoid the sheetrock thing, right? But still, uh, the, uh, the, whatever those things are, in other words, they're actually doing carpentry work. They're actually doing carpentry work. So that's the gift of helps, is you actually participate in the ministry. So for example... If there's someone in the church that had the gift of administration, then someone who had the gift of helps for a season, and this is another thing you need to keep in mind for somebody with a gift of helps, for a season they would come alongside and they would be participating in, it, in an administration activity. 
actually doing administration tasks in conjunction with the one who is the gifted administrator. And then maybe in, in the next season, they might be involved with someone who has the gift of, of exhortation or comfort. And so that person with the gift of helps fits into so many different areas within a, a, a church ministry. Same thing with the gift of service. If you think about it, someone with the gift of service, a server minister, would be able to participate in any ministry. It doesn't matter what the ministry is. Uh, Molly's not here today. I'm picking on her even though she's not here. She wasn't feeling well. Um, keep her in your prayers. She's going through some things with her neck, and, and uh, she's, she's hurting today. So keep her in your prayers. But uh, Molly volunteered, and uh, Larry has done like, likewise. I'm picking on two of them that aren't here today. But, but Molly and Larry have volunteered that, for instance, if we need handouts, you know, that I can print them, and they'll take care of them. They'll go get the handouts. They'll staple them. They'll put them together, and they'll bring them out and hand them out to folks here in the church. Now, which one is that? Is that helps or is that service? That's service. That's service because they're not actually teaching the Word, but what they're doing is they're taking care of a task that enables the flock to be edified. And I could certainly... See, the thing is, I could certainly walk back there and grab the, grab the papers and I could staple them. It's not like the one who has the gift is not capable of doing those things, but by the person doing that work of service, it enables the individual more time to focus on the primary use of their gift. Does that make sense? That's the service gift, and then we have the helps gift. I want to make sure we're clear on those two. Then we looked at this gift, which is extremely versatile. It's the paraclesis gift, and I have to use that because it's so versatile. I almost have to call it the paraclesis gift because the paraclete is one who's able to encourage, comfort, exhort, even rebuke. It's a very versatile gift. Now, those who, we all have the capacity to do these things. And again, this person is gifted and is able to do so above and beyond. Does a pastor potentially have this gift? Possibly. But keep in mind that what this gift is really all about, the para is alongside. That, that para at the beginning of this, right there, the, that's a prefix. The para means alongside. This is a come alongside gift. This is a one-on-one -on -one gift. In other words, I often from the from the pulpit will exhort, encourage, admonish, rebuke, whatever. I will do that from the pulpit. But that's a pastoral ministry. That's, done, that's a pulpit ministry. This gift is a come alongside a one-on-one -on -one ministry. It's built into the name of the gift itself. It's a one-on-one -on -one come alongside ministry. But it's this ability to not only to recognize when someone needs this, but also to have that capacity to come alongside and do these things. Now, we just read in our reading this week to admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak. All right, so someone who has this gift is uniquely qualified to recognize when someone is going through something. Are they unruly and they need an admonishment? Are they faint-hearted at the moment and they just need to be encouraged? Are they weak and they just need some help, right? Someone who has this gift would be able to recognize that. And by the way, all of these gifts are exercised prayerfully. So the encourager, the paraclete, doesn't just offhand say, oh, well, this person's unruly. I'm going to give them an admonishment. No, they prayerfully consider the situation. It might be that someone's going through a struggle that has to do with being faint-hearted or weak and not that they're unruly. They're not being disobedient or unruly. And this person would pray about that and ask for God to help them understand. But this is a person uniquely qualified to recognize this and come alongside in a one-on-one -on -one manner and encourage, comfort, exhort, admonish, all of those things that we're talking about, right, that you would be able to do that. Now, all of this is done in love. This is very important. All of the gifts that we talk about should be done in the sphere of love. All of them should be done. So if you're helping somebody, do it in love. If you're serving somebody, do it in love. If you're exhorting somebody, do it in love. If you're encouraging somebody, do it in love. The ex exhortations, the admonishments, the rebukes, those are harder to understand for us in terms of love, but they should be done in love. In other words, whatever you're doing, do it to build the other person up, not to tear them down. Again, I talked about this last week. You don't have control over how it's received. You don't. But you do have control over how it's delivered. And make sure that you're doing it in love and in a loving way. 
But this is a powerful gift. And there are almost always within a flock, there are multiple paracletes within a flock of believers. Multiple paracletes. Because the pastor, who is the shepherd of the flock, the under-shepherd, obviously, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, right? The good shepherd. And so the pastor is the under-shepherd. But the pastor is only going to be able to recognize the situations that happen to a certain extent. Instead, God is going to gift an assembly with paracletes, with these individuals with this gift who might be able to then come alongside and help believers that are struggling. And a paraclete, for example, may very well in a situation come to the pastor and say, I've been coming alongside this individual and um, pray for them and Maybe at some point you might want to talk to them yourself or whatever else without gossiping, obviously, but do it in such a way that they can bring that to the pastor if it's necessary. But in many cases, a paraclete, we saw this at Austin Bible Church. I've seen it here at Lost Pines. A paraclete can come alongside and perform a ministry where the pastor ends up never even being involved because the paraclete ministers to that individual with encouragement or comfort or, or an exhortation or whatever it is in such a way that they're able to, uh, to help that individual through whatever they're struggling with, and the pastor never even gets involved. But this is a powerful gift. Any questions on those three so far? Are we pretty straight on those? You understand what an exhortation is, right, from the Scripture. You might exhort somebody if they're not doing what the Scriptures say. You might exhort them. Uh, encouragement is, you know, in, the idea of encouraging the faint-hearted. Maybe, for example, example on that might be, an individual who's not sure, they think maybe the Lord is calling them to a ministry, but they're kind of a little bit timid about it, and you might encourage them in that, talk with them, encourage them. The Lord is opening this door for you. It looks sure looks like it. You know, I encourage you to, to pursue that. If that's a ministry the Lord's opening the door for, pursue that. That would be an encouragement for them, right? Um, exhortation and, and admonishment is in the area where someone is not walking as they should. Now, this one is... One that I want, I'm sorry, let me go back, is mer the gift of mercy. I want to do a little better uh, explanation on this than I did last week. Um, when we talk about the definitions of grace and mercy, I think the, the definition I gave last week is best to use as a definition of grace and mercy from the perspective of God. God pours out grace in, the, in that He gives people things that they don't deserve. Right? That's what grace is. Unmerited favor. That's what it means. Unmerited favor. So you receive favor from God when you don't deserve it. Mercy is when God does not give us what we do deserve. Right? We deserve, again, to be in the lake of fire. But we're not going to be in the lake of fire because God had mercy on us and sent His Son to die for us. And so we are in His mercy and obviously in His grace as well in that we have been rescued from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of light. We are blessed in that. So that's mercy from God's perspective. Mercy, in the pers from our perspective, who are we to sit around and judge what somebody deserves or doesn't deserve? So mercy is really a matter of extending a hand of compassion to those who are struggling in any situation, right? So mercy could be extended to anyone who is struggling in any situation. Again, we all have the capacity to show mercy, and we should. But this is a surpassing grace empowerment, the ability to extend mercy to others and even keep them from losing heart. This one I thought was a, the 2 Corinthians 4.1 passage. In fact, I'm going to turn back to that again if you want to turn with me to that. And I apologize for my weak voice with the cold today. Talking about the ministry that they've received since we have this ministry as we have received mercy we do not lose heart and this is paul you think to yourself no wait a minute the apostle paul was in jeopardy and in danger of losing heart yes actually in fact when he walked into to athens uh, excuse me to corinth when he walked into corinth he was very discouraged in his missionary missionary journeys he had been he'd met with a lot of resistance a lot of persecution and even though some had believed, there were many that had not and, and had given him great grief for the fact that he was preaching Christ when he was the one who had been uh, the Pharisee of Pharisees, the one who had been out killing the Christians, and now he's proclaiming Christ? You've got to be kidding me, right? So uh, they were, they were very, there was very much opposition to Paul, and when he walked into Corinth by himself, he was, he was discouraged. 
So Paul was certainly susceptible to lose heart, and if he's susceptible, then any of us are susceptible. So as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So what I'm here to tell you is this, as we extend mercy, and certainly someone who has this gift and is able to extend mercy in a spectacular, supernatural way, they are able to keep others from losing heart, someone who might be going through something very difficult. I mean, for example, you can think of all kinds of examples of, of the, mer- the gift of mercy. And somebody who, who's ill, and so you go to the hospital and you encourage them in the hospital as they're going through a difficult time. Uh, a prison ministry. Um, somebody who's, who's grieving because they lost a loved one. Uh, you can apply it to all kinds of scenarios, the gift of mercy. And it's a valuable, mer- a valuable gift within a local church because we're all susceptible to struggles, to sorrows, to griefs, to uh, discouragements. And so somebody with this gift is able to extend mercy to anyone who's going through those kinds of things and uh, keep them from losing heart, encourage them. Whoops, sorry about that. Any questions on that? Let me back up. Any questions on mercy? So we have four gifts we've looked at. This is all in review. We've had the gift of helps, the gift of service, one moment, the gift of helps, the gift of service, the paraclete, which is the encourager, comforter, exhorter, and then we've had the gift of mercy. Yes, ma'am. The paraclete and the mercy gift often go hand in hand. You'll you kind of notice, I've kind of grouped these in a way that's kind of where they kind of fit together. Someone who has the gift of mercy might very well uh, work alongside the, the paraclete in terms of extending mercy to someone who's going through a struggle. That's right. The, but the paraclete is the one who probably will recognize the situation and come alongside. And the one who has the gift of mercy is able to go in not only in those situations, but other situations. Maybe the pastor knows of something or whatever. But yes, they go hand in hand, absolutely, very much so. Um, but if you had to have this gift, you should be looking for ministry opportunities in that regard to, uh, to extend mercy to individuals who are, are struggling. Does that make sense? But yes, that's a good point, Heidi. They go hand in hand. Exhorter, comforter, encourager, and then the gift of mercy. The next gift, giving. Now, the mistake that most people make in regard to this gift is immediately their mind goes to money. And that's a mistake. Now, if you've lived the life that I have, where I grew up in a fairly modest means, money is not the first thing that comes to my mind. Every believer has the capacity to give to others. Let's take a look at some of these verses. We, this is not review anymore. This is new. Ephesians 4.28. Back up here a second. This is all kinds of imperatives given here in this passage in Ephesians chapter 4. We get down to verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. This is the idea of sharing and the giving. This is the idea of a giving capacity, right? Being able to give to others. If if you're in the business of uh, stealing everything that you have, you're not going to be able to do that. Rather, he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And then the admonishment of the tongue here. I've got to read this while I'm here. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Are your words words of grace, or are they words that tear people down? That's what you've got to think about. But this idea of giving, we need to, we need to labor so that we can have something to share. Now, who, who, is, who is the one that provides us with whatever we have? God, absolutely. Amen to that. Whatever we have is given to us by God, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be diligent in labor nonetheless. Second Corinthians 9, you had to know I was going to turn there. Second Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 15. Turn there in my paper Bible to give you a chance. Hey, wow, I opened right to the page. Thank you, Lord. Second Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 15, I believe it was. Is that right? 7 through 15. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, 
not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's start right there. That's, that, is what, that is the operative function for us today in terms of giving. And, I, and again, don't just think of money in this. Don't just think of money. But we should be giving not grudgingly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. So if I were to stand up here and tell you you are subject to the tithe and you have to give your 10% and you give because you know you have to, then you won't qualify under verse 7, will you? If, you're doing, if it's a have to instead of a want to, then you're not really operating under the qualifications of, the, of the, the mode of operation that we have today. Now, if you want to use the tithe as a guideline, a lot of people do. If you want to use the tithe, the 10% tithe as a guideline, that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it should be done cheerfully. It be, should, should be something you want to do, not grudgingly and not under compulsion. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now, could there be any more superlatives in that verse? God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, <laughs> you may have an abundance for every good deed. So in other words, if you, have an, if, if you are giving and you're cheerfully giving, don't be concerned that somehow you're going to be without because God is able to make all grace abound to you. As it is written, He scattered abroad, He gave to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for, the fo- bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality. This is one time when liberality is a good thing, when for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God, right? In other words, this is the, that, lib, that liberal giving, the, the cheerful giving. Through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgiving to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your, excuse me, to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them all. And that's a really cool word there because that's koinonia, which is the same word we have for fellowship in our Bible, the liberality of your contribution, the sharing to them and to all, while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Now, this is, this is beautiful, the way this ends. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. All right. So in this very passage talking about giving and the, the liberality of the giving and the evidence of that giving and the thanksgiving to God, then it brings it back home, right? Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift, that is the gift of salvation, through faith in His Son. He gave us His Son that we might live. So that pretty much trumps everything in terms of giving, doesn't it? Uh, When you think about what God gave, really whatever giving we do pales in comparison to that. But this is a wonderful passage that talks about the the ministry of giving. And giving is not just in this this, from the perspective, perspective of money. It could be in any capacity. You could give of your time. You could give... uh, I mean, we had donations given to the estate sale, for example. You could give of your possessions. You could give of your money. You could give of your time. There are many ways you could give. Those who give are blessed. Acts 20.35 and Philippians 4.17. Probably familiar with this, this. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the blessing of giving, right? It's a blessing to give. Philippians 4, 17. And here he's talking about the receiving of the gift. He says, Paul says here, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragment aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. See, this is a description of what that gift is going to be, a fragment aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. That's what that gift is going to be. 
Now, see, here's what Paul is saying. I'm not seeking the gift, but I seek for the profit, which increases. In other words, the one who gave is actually going to spiritually profit. This is talking about spiritual profit, by the way. The one who gave and did so cheerfully and willingly has a profit. They, there's an increase to their account. So the one who gives is blessed, spiritually blessed, spiritually rewarded for the giving. Now, before I move on, let me say this. This is very important to keep in mind. This is a real challenge, a humility test, actually. There are going to be seasons where we are blessed with an abundance and we're able to give. And that could be an abundance of time. It could be an abundance of, of uh, financial provisions. It could be an abundance of materials. It could be an abundance in any, any category. And we're able to give. And we should do so not under compulsion or grudgingly, but cheerfully, right? There are going to be seasons where we have to receive, where we are in a position where it is the others who are giving and we are receiving the gift. Now, this, this passage we just read in Philippians, Paul was the recipient of the gift. And he had to have the humility to receive that gift. The gift was given to him. The provision was made such that he was able to continue on in his ministry. Those had, there are many who had given to support his missionary ministries, his missionary travels, and all the things that he was doing. And he had to have the humility to re- accept those gifts. That's hard to do. I don't know about for you, but that's hard to do. But he had to accept it. But he, in doing so, what, he just, what we just read in the Philippians passage is in doing so, his thoughts were not about the gift and the fact that he was in a position that he had to receive a gift to support his ministry. I mean, you think about it. He was a tent maker. Right, and he, he could he could supply for himself by making tents. You know, that's the we talk about the tent making. That's what I'm doing right now in terms of my engineering job. One moment, what, what's my engineering job? Is I'm I'm making tents in my engineering job. This was a situation where they were supplying for Paul, so he could completely focus on his ministry, and he had to have the humility accept to accept that gift. But his where was his focus? I seek for the profit which increases to your account. In other words. By receiving that gift, he was thinking about how the givers were being blessed. That's where his mind was oriented, was to the, where the givers and how they were going to be blessed. Was yes? Paul was fairly well-to-do uh, before, he be, before he accepted Christ as his Savior, but like many Christians, like many Jews, especially at the time, who accepted Christ, uh, their wealth, dis, uh, their wealth dis, dis, dissipated fairly fast. Uh, because uh, they basically were shut out. The Jews who accepted Christ were, were basically considered, uh, uh, they were exiled, I guess is a good way to say it. They were excluded from many of the activities, including business activities. And by the time he was participating in his missionary journeys, he was in need of financial support. I, I, yeah. I Paul pretty much had to give up uh, all of that in order to in order to follow after Christ, and he was willing to do that, as he as he explains in his in his letters. You know, I consider it all lost for the sake of Christ. Right? He was willing to give up any of that. But many Jews, even even the uh, you know the just uh, Jews that were not as well known, because recognize he was fairly well known. Uh, Jews that were not as well known as Paul. <laughs> When they would accept Christ and they would proclaim Christ, they would be excluded. They wouldn't business, people wouldn't do business with them anymore. Uh, they would have a hard time in, in the society that they were, they were used to being involved in. They were pretty much excluded from all of that. And so many of them, that's why many of them, by the way, would end up just selling their property and taking the money and, and sharing it with others because they, they knew that, that they weren't going to be able to keep that property anyway. They were, you know, they, their, their business was going to die and all those things were going to happen. They could see that happening. But uh, my exhortation, though, was about the receiving of the gift. Paul here had the humility to receive the gift. And if you happen to be in a position where you find yourself in a place where you're, you're going to be the recipient of a gift rather than the giver of the gift, recognize that uh, that's something that the Lord has for us as a test and as part of, a, of the way it works. I don't know if it's ever going to happen or not, but if the Lord ever, uh, you know, f- provided for this this local church in such a way uh, that I w- that the the deacons came to me and said we want to we want to pay you a salary so you don't have to work a secular job anymore, that would be a humility test for me, because I would have to say, okay, well the the congregation wants to provide for me, 
And uh, I would have to be humble enough to accept that. Uh, and that's, that's the hard, the hard part sometimes is receiving the gift rather than giving. A good faith test too, that's right. It'd be a good faith test, that's exactly right. Very good point, Zach. A believer with a spiritual gift of giving has the surpassing grace empowerment to give of themselves in abundance with exceeding joy. This is what I want you to see is that not only can they give abundantly, but they can do so with exceeding joy. If you find that you have an abundance, but when you give it, it's not fun, you don't, you don't enjoy the giving, then you probably don't have this gift, either that or your carnal one. But uh, the truth is you're not functioning in the gift at, at a very minimum. But the person who has this gift is able to give abundantly with exceeding joy. So that's an indication of this gift. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the giving may be in the form of money or possessions, but it also may be the sharing of your time or attention. Now that is one that some people don't think about. Giving of your attention. This is something the, all, of, all, of, all of us men struggle with, right? <laughs> Husbands fail in this regard, but <clears throat> giving of attention, lending a hand, whatever it might be, Whatever it might be. Let's take a look at the, the monetary issues in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and through 19. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. It says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. You see that whole idea again, right? The koinonia kind of thing, that sharing idea. Storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So this is the idea of sharing in, in terms of wealth, possessions, Luke 3.11. I would say a better way to think of all of this is the person who has this gift can abundantly give of themselves in whatever fashion and can do it with exceeding joy. Luke chapter 3 and verse 11. He's posing something to them and the crowds were questioning him saying then, what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. It goes on from there. Again, the sharing idea, right? We see that over and over again, the idea of sharing. Uh, I mentioned before, we don't live in the environment that the believers did in the early church. It was an interesting environment where they lived because they were under severe persecution. Uh, they had to come together and live almost in a communal kind of an environment where they, get, they sold of their possessions. They pooled their monies together and supported one another. We may, we may yet in our lifetimes witness that again, that we may, as a local church, need to come together. I'm convinced that the believers in the tribulation are going to do just that because the believers in the tribulation are not going to take the mark of the beast. And because they don't take the mark of the beast, they're going to be excluded from the worldwide economy. So how is it that they're going to get their food? How are they going to get their provisions? How are they going to make it through life? I believe there's going to be this underground movement of the believers that support one another. And there's going to be an underground economy, basically, that's going to be the believers doing that. Well, in our lifetimes, will we find ourselves in a situation where, once again, we have to function in a manner similar to the way the early church did? We may. We're seeing the birth pangs of that. Uh, more and more, the Christian faith is coming under persecution. For now, it's, we're not under threat of being put into handcuffs and taken off to jail. But what we believe in is, is the only thing that people don't tolerate, right? That people will tolerate everything except for the Christian faith, right? So uh, we're seeing more and more of that sort of thing. And we're discovering that uh, you know, our liberties may gradually erode away in this land. And if that happens, we may eventually find ourselves in a situation where we as a local church have to come together and support one another. Would you, were you raising your hand? We may have to. Uh, we're not there yet, but we may come back to that. But the person who has this, this gift is able to give of themselves exceedingly and abundantly with exceeding joy. And what we'll do is we'll come back next time and we'll move on to another category 
of gifts here where we start talking about leadership. But what I want to do now is I want to talk, since we just finished with this exceeding joy, I want to talk about our passage of, passage of the week. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And this is a will of God passage. We've talked about this before, the will of God passage. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So let's all say that together. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Say it with me. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Okay, I want you to try to dwell on this passage this week. If you can, memorize it. It's a familiar passage. Hopefully it won't be that hard to memorize. Memorize where it's located, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you can remember that it's verses 16 through 18, that's awesome. But at least remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The message of this passage, pray about this. Do I rejoice always in any circumstance? Or do I grumble and complain? I mean, if we're honest, we grumble and complain, don't we? Do I pray without ceasing? My prayer life is pathetic compared to what it needs to be. Praying is important, folks. We should pray about things all day long. We should have an ongoing conversation with God. I recommend that, that you have this ongoing conversation with God throughout the day, just at all times. Talk to Him. Talk to Him. Prayer is an effective thing, and it's powerful. The idea of praying without ceasing is that it's, it's, a, it's part of our everyday life all throughout the day. And I be, I'm going to tell you, I fail, I fail, I mean, strike one, strike two, right? I've struck, on, I've been, I've been sw- a swing and a miss on both 16 and 17. And then we get to verse 18, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do we thank God for everything? I, the, the one, the one Example of this that I've quoted to you guys before, and it was just so powerful the way it was done. David Pickett, who I think he's still a deacon at Austin Bible Church. Uh, David Pickett, young man, found out he had a heart valve problem, and he was going to have to have open heart surgery. And at first, he grumbled and complained. (laughs) That's what happened. At first, he grumbled and complained, and then he realized that this was something that the Lord was giving him And instead of that, he went to the Lord in prayer, and he confessed his grumbling and his complaining, and he thanked the Lord for the test. He thanked him for providing him that test. He asked the question that Molly always talks about. He asked the question of the Lord, okay, if I go through this test and I I live through this heart surgery, who are you going to put in my path that I can minister to, right? In other words, he embraced it. He thanked God for it. We are being placed in circumstances and conditions every single day of our lives. And by and large, everybody in this congregation would have to admit we've been abundantly blessed, if nothing else, because of the fact that we've been born in this country, we've been blessed. Poor people in this country are rich compared to poor people in other countries. I've seen that firsthand. So we are abundantly blessed. So when you consider whatever your circumstances and conditions are, recognize that God's in control. He has put you in that circumstance and in that condition. And so if uh, closings are delayed or closings are anticipated or uh, people's father, my wife's father, has gone through open heart surgery or whatever it is you might be facing, you're battling leukemia, whatever it is, that the situation might be. God has put you in those circumstances and conditions. And it is His will for you to be thankful for everything, whatever it is that comes your way. Be thankful because He is helping you to grow in whatever it is that you face in your circumstances and conditions. He's not giving you your testings or your temptations or whatever it is that you find your circumstances and conditions to be. He's not giving you those things so that you'll fail. He's giving you those things so that you will succeed and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So all three of these I fail on. But this is God's will for me, and this is God's will for you, that we would rejoice always. So we, to apply it then to what we're learning is rejoice when you help somebody. Rejoice when you are of service to somebody. 
Rejoice when you encourage somebody. Rejoice when you have mercy on somebody. Rejoice when you give. Right? Whatever it is. Which one am I skipping? Am I skipping one? Nope, I'm not. Okay, so rejoice when you give. Rejoice when you apply every one of these gifts. Even if it's just a ministry, if you don't have the gift, rejoice in the middle of all that. Pray throughout that. If you, are, if you have an opportunity to help somebody, pray about that. Pray that the Lord will show you that's where you should be. Pray as you're helping them. Pray without ceasing. Uh, in everything, give thanks. Be thankful for the gift that you have. Be thankful for the ministries you have. Be thankful for the circumstances you find yourself in. We are all so incredibly blessed. It's unbelievable. We should, we should never, honestly, we should never complain. We should never complain. I caught, I caught cold recently. I got, I got a few days off from work, and what happens, the very first day I find myself sick with a cold. I could complain about that. Uh, I also, on Thanksgiving morning, before we headed down to Houston, I went to pick up something to help my wife, and I threw my back out. And so I've got a lower back that's killing me, and I can hardly breathe. So I could sit around and complain, right? Guess what? I've got so many blessings, I can't even count them. So am I going to sit around and complain about a cold and a back that hurts me a little bit? All I've got to do is think about Ken back there. Ken's back looks like a jigsaw puzzle. In fact, it looks like a jigsaw puzzle that somebody put some bailing wire and duct tape on, doesn't it? He's got a back that's totally, totally in a mess, and he goes through every single day with back pain. So I'm going to complain because I got a little lower back pain? Come on, I'm being a crybaby. I'm having my little pity party. The truth is I should be able to rejoice always. I should be constantly in prayer, and I should be able to give thanks in everything. So memorize this verse, this passage, I should say. Dwell on it. Pray about it. Recognize well you, where you fall short, because we all do, but recognize this is God's will for you. And uh, as we learned about in our reading this time, excel still more. In other words, strive to be closer to this kind of a hard attitude on a day-by-day basis. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. <clears throat> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time of study in the spiritual gifts We thank you that you do provide these gifts, and I believe that you have provided gifts of all sorts within this congregation, and I pray that you'll help the individuals within this congregation recognize their giftedness, that they will be zealous for employing those gifts in a manner that can serve others with those gifts and bless others with those gifts. And Father, we ask that you would help us to have the hard attitude we were just reading about, the hard attitude of rejoicing the hard attitude that wants to pray all day long, every day, and the hard attitude of thanks. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us that's so powerful, your truth. It truly makes a difference in our lives. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.